I, I have a cold. I'm recovering from a cold, and so my voice, which is usually croaky on a good day, is going to be crookier today, so I wanted to warn you. Um, I want to start by, by saying to Mrs. Vivian Bailey, it is an honor to be in the same room as you, ma'am. A great, great honor. Thank you for the largeness of your heart, and thank you for being an inspiration. A story about <clears throat> about my parents. In 1967, 50 years ago, my parents lived in Nsuka, a university town in eastern Nigeria. My father had just returned from the US where he got his PhD in statistics from Berkeley and he was employed as a lecturer. It was a heady and hopeful time across Africa. Many countries were newly independent from Britain or from France, and many Africans were eager to help build their countries. My parents had two small children, <coughs> my sisters, a house, a car, a cook, and a stable life full of cocktail parties and evenings spent with friends at the university staff club. Then the Nigeria Biafra War started. Only days later, my parents heard the sound of shelling and gunfire, so frightening, so close, that they had very little time to pack anything before they ran. They ended up in another town, a town already very crowded. Even the refugee camps were full. My father was desperate. He was worried about being out in the open because of the possibility of air raids. He knew a man who was from that town, a man called Emmanuel Ezike. Emmanuel lived in a cramped house that was full of people, members of his extended family, people whose homes the war had also snatched. My father also knew that it would be very difficult for Emmanuel to accommodate them, very difficult to stretch what was already badly stretched. Still, my father knocked on Emmanuel's door. Emmanuel looked at my parents, holding onto their two small, scared children. Their, daughter sh their, their faces shadowed in despair, and he said, we will make room for you. I think often of that moment, because I wonder if my parents would have survived the war had they not benefited from that act of kindness. For three years, my parents were refugees. But they were not just refugees. Nobody is ever just a refugee. Nobody is ever just a poor person. Nobody is ever just a single thing. I've loved books my whole life, and I've come to think of literature as my religion. I learn from literature. And one lesson I have taken from literature is that the only thing we humans can be certain of in our lives is uncertainty. Anything can happen. We don't know tomorrow. We can't know tomorrow. And there's something beautiful about embracing this unknowability. It brings a certain kind of peace. But is it also because of this precariousness of life that organizations like Community Action Council are so important? I know of a very wealthy woman who never imagined that she would ever be a person in need until it turned out that her wealth manager was fraudulent and had used her entire wealth in a complicated Ponzi scheme and she lost all her money. She went overnight from being a person who gave to being a person who received. That woman could be any of us. Well, actually, she had much more money than most of us here. But the larger point still holds. We are one crisis away from catastrophe. It could be the loss of a loved one, a sudden grief illness, and suddenly we become people who need help. The truth of our existence on Earth is that at any time in our lives, we might need a safety net, a helping hand, a gentle push. I came to the U.S. 20 years ago. I came because I had started studying medicine in Nigeria, 
and I didn't really want to be a doctor. And so I decided to flee the study of medicine and come to the US. Shortly after I arrived, I realized that for many Americans, an African immigrant was a person who was fleeing catastrophe, war or extreme poverty, someone who grew up with nothing or whose village had been burnt down. The story of catastrophe in Africa is important, but it is not my story. I was baffled by how many Americans expected me to talk about my experience with poverty, because they automatically assumed that to be African was to be poor. Of course, I knew of poverty. I knew that many Nigerians didn't have the privileges that my family had while I was growing up. My parents had picked up their lives after the war ended. By the time I was born in 1977, my father had become a food professor, and my mother an administrator who later became the first woman to head the university administration, and I feel immensely proud of her. I grew up surrounded by books, with access to a good education, good health care, a wonderful children's library. But my parents always made it clear that we had a duty to help those who, who needed help. Not because we were better than them, but because we could have been them. We too could very well be the ones in need. I, I used, uh, before I came to the US, I thought quite naively that there were no poor people in America. Maybe it was the American films that I had seen with their slick stories and their uncomplicated resolutions and the fact that everybody seemed to have a car. <laughs> so I was certain that every American had a car. After all, in American films, even teenagers actually owned their own cars. In my own teenage years, I begged and pleaded and schemed and manipulated for years until my mother let me drive her car, at which point I wasn't really a teenager anymore. But in Philadelphia, where I first lived when I came to the US, I was shocked at the poverty of West Philadelphia, boarded up buildings, people who looked as though they had lost not only material things, but also hope. That image of Philadelphia planted in my mind a single story of American poverty. That poverty is a thing apart, a thing for black and brown people, and that it always has an abject quality to it. Today, I know how wrong I was. I now know that poverty has different faces, and that poverty is not necessarily written on anybody's face. I know this particularly now that I call Howard County my American home. I'll explain what I mean, but first let me tell you about having an American home. I used to roll my eyes at people who, when they were asked where they lived, would mention two places. <clears throat> But I have become one of those people. <laughs> and I am now forced to roll my eyes at myself. I have two homes. One in Lagos, in Nigeria, and the other here in Howard County. When I finished graduate school, I was fortunate to already be earning a living from my writing. And I knew I wanted to divide my time between Nigeria and the US. And I didn't want to live in New York, which I love, but I find it to be a bit too much, because I already live in Lagos, which is in itself a bit too much. <laughs> and so I wanted a quieter place in the US where I could write. And then I married a lovely man who happened to work as a physician and who happened to live in Howard County. And so this has been my American home ever since. Long before my husband and I even thought about having children, we were constantly told just how wonderful a place Howard County is for raising children. And now that we have a three-year-old, I'm going to start bothering other newlyweds with that information. <laughs> Actually, I think I'll just probably tell every single man and woman I meet, Howard County is wonderful for raising children. <clears throat> Hurry up. <laughs> I like it here. I like the diversity 
I like that I feel welcome. At the playground, I find it so heartwarming, so beautiful to see children who are so different from one another. <clears throat> Korean children, Indian children, Hispanic children, white children, African-American children, African children, some of them bilingual like my daughter, playing and seeing each other's humanity. Because society has not yet poisoned them to make judgments based on appearance. And by being surrounded by people who are different from them, these children are being prepared to live in a world that is increasingly globalized. Howard County is one of the wealthiest counties in the US, and yet 26% of people who live here are poor. They struggle to meet their needs. This is a culture, American culture, that lionizes wealth. The American dream is about getting and owning and having. It's about acquisition and consumption. And this complicates the way we think of poverty. It is important, I think, to address the stigma of being poor in Howard County, of being poor in America. It is important to speak about poverty in a different way. Often, in speaking of the poor, we personalize poverty. <clears throat> We make it about the individual, and, and there is also often the suggestion of laziness. Yes, of course, there are lazy people in the world, but it isn't very convincing to link poverty and laziness, because there are many successful people who are lazy. I'm not speaking from experience. <laughs> not entirely. It makes more sense <clears throat> It makes more sense to think of poverty in structural terms, which is to say that in thinking and talking of poverty, we must, <coughs> sorry. It makes more sense to think of poverty in structural terms. And it makes sense to think of its solution, not only in structural terms, but in human terms, which is to say that in thinking and talking of poverty, we must remember always that dignity. Thank you, that's very kind. <coughs> I'll try again. So it makes more sense to think of poverty in structural terms. And it makes sense to think of its solution, not only in structural terms, but also in human terms. Which is to say that in thinking and talking of poverty, we must remember always that dignity matters. Dignity matters. Dignity is as important as a loaf of bread. And this recognition of dignity is what I was most moved by when I visited <coughs> CSC, the CSC programs this past summer. The food bank is structured like a supermarket where people in need can hold on to their dignity while receiving the help they need. And it's important to remember that going to the food bank doesn't necessarily mean you have nothing at all. It's a wonderful resource for many families who can, from time to time, be overstretched. Going to the food bank, for example, can mean that you then save $50 that you can use toward gas or childcare. And I would like particularly to thank Lillian Bowder and Earl and Mary Amija, who I hope are here. And if they are, could, they, uh, could I embarrass them and ask them to wave? <coughs> um, because, because of their contributions, the food bank is open now evenings and weekends, and also has an inventory system that allows it to cater to people's needs in more specific and more efficient ways. I visited the pre-K program, and I saw a diverse group of lovely children eating healthy food, which I found very exciting, and their teachers so kind and firm and warm. And as I was about to leave, having spent a bit of time there, <coughs> One of the boys looked at me for a while, and then he very helpfully informed me that I was scary. 
<laughs> it must have been the outfit I was wearing, which I thought was very fashionable. <laughs> but I think what we can tell is that this wonderful program is teaching children to be honest, truth tellers. <laughs> I was also impressed <clears throat> by the example of, of the practical, people-centered solution to problems. And here, I want to thank the Howard County leadership for what is now the Community Resource Campus that brings together more than, 50, uh, more than 15 um, human service organizations. So what it means is that it's now a one-stop um, <clears throat> journey for anyone who might need help from different organizations, and people often do need help from different organizations at the same time. It's quite easy to forget how logistical problems, such as access to transportation, can prevent a person in need from getting the help they need. There is enough food in America. Nobody needs to go hungry. What we lack are the collaborations and the connections, and CSC is playing an important role there. It is wonderful. <clears throat> it is wonderful that CAC can help a person in need with free food and will talk to the electric company about not turning off your energy in the winter and they will help you with housing. But it's even more wonderful that CAC sees poverty <coughs> as a scourge that can start a generational cycle and that their long term goal is self sufficiency. And obviously, CAC needs our help. We can help by writing a big check, or a small check, but big checks are preferred. <laughs> we can help by volunteering. We can help by becoming mentors to people who are looking for a job. For someone looking for success, <clears throat> the mere proximity to other people who have had success can be a wonderful incentive. Sometimes you need somebody to teach you how to conduct yourself during a job interview or how to make decisions, things that you might not know unless someone who's done it before tells you about. <clears throat> and here I want to thank Peter Dayhoff for her strength, for her optimism, for your incredible hard work and for your faith in how important this, this is and how much it matters. And I could tell from spending time with you. And I thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. And all the wonderful people. <laughs> thank you. And also to all the wonderful people who work with Peter, because she has a great team. And obviously, she can't do it on her own. <clears throat> Peter spoke to me about all the kind donations from people here in Howard County. And I feel quite proud to live in a community so full of generous people. And I know that generosity will only continue. It is clear to me that people here know what community really means. That you are better off if your fellow citizen is better off. <clears throat> and so I just want to see how inspiring it is to be here, to live here, now that I know that you all are very kind people. <laughs> and I know some of the donors are here, so thank you. <clears throat> so when I, was, when I, when I visited um, Bitta in the summer and met some of the, the lovely people who work with her, one of whom is Jen, and I asked what one needed to be useful as a volunteer. And Jen replied very simply, love and passion. And so on that note, I hope for all of us here that we may be filled with love and passion. Thank you. Thank you.